Hello and welcome to our ninth AIB Journals webinar, presenting the latest research from the two journals of the Association, the Journal of International Business Studies and the Journal of International Business Policy. My name is Klaus Meyer, and I'm a professor of international business at the Ivy Business School. I'll be your host today, and as co-host, uh, Steve Brammer is joining us from the University of Bath. Steve is a scholar who's extensively published on corporate social responsibility and uh, related issues. Uh, and he uh, then moved into a, a dean's role, actually he moved to Australia to take over a deanship and recently moved back to the UK, become dean of the School of Management in Bath. Uh, he will be the one who is moderating the discussion today. Uh, as most of the people in the audience know, we are organizing this web, uh, series of webinars to provide a new forum for discussing research ideas, uh, using the opportunities of the new technologies and people getting familiar with how to use webinars and people get used to listening to webinars as a means to access uh, latest ideas in research. Before we get started, I would like to extend my thanks to the people who made this happen, which of course includes the journal editors and the uh, board of the association, but uh, the special thanks go to the people who behind the scenes take care of the technology. And that's Renfei Gao in Manchester and Tunga Kiyak at the ARB office. And of course, as usual, my thanks go to Tim Devini, who together with myself has initiated this series and is moderating half of the seminars. Uh, the idea for this is that we talk about published papers. So the papers that the authors are going to talk about can be found in the Journal of International Business Policy or the Journal of B International Business Studies. In fact, two of the papers are uh, in advance online. So they are really up, uh, latest research. Uh, our back idea in selecting papers is that we bring in to bring together some experienced known people in the field with younger people and, and, and faces and names that you're probably less familiar with. You in the audience, you can actively participate and hope you, I hope you will do that. Uh, in Zoom, you have a Q&A function. You can ask questions to the Q&A, uh, which then will be asked to the presenters by Steve, who is moderating the discussion. Uh, you can also vote for questions uh, in a way to by clicking the like button and the more likes a question get the higher the question goes into the ranking which means it's more likely to get steve's attention into when he selects questions to ask to the panelists and with that introduction i hand over to steve please Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. And thanks to Tim and Klaus for the opportunity to participate in this. As, as Klaus intimated, uh, IB isn't my natural constituency. I'm a business and society and a strategy scholar for the most part. More, more on that in a mo. Uh, um, but I'm really happy to connect with this community. And I think um, we have ahead of us a really exciting session with three fabulous papers from three fabulous author teams. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to share those and introduce those authors and give them an opportunity to share uh, their research in the hope that that will provoke uh, discourse in the community and ideas for collaborations and, and future research. As Klaus says, two of the papers are hot off the press, uh, um, accepted in jibs, and the other is very, very warm off the press, uh, um, just out uh, in JIBP. So I think um, they're a really high quality um, cluster of papers. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful to the authors for, for being here today to share their work. I'm really happy to see so many participants. I see some old friends and colleagues and collaborators on that list. Uh, welcome to today's session. And, and I'd like to echo um, Klaus's invitation to actively participate in today's session. You know, the more engagement there is, the better for you, the better for the quality of the, the interaction uh, and the outcomes of the session. Uh, in many ways, all of us are, are learning these new technologies and I think they are having profound and actually in many ways very positive uh, impacts on our ability to uh, communicate and collaborate with each other and to sustain uh, our connection and engagement within our communities. So I, I very much welcome an opportunity to uh, participate in moderating today's um, 
discussion. For those that don't know me, my name's Steve Brammer. I'm now Dean uh, at the School of Management at the University of Bath. But for many years before I uh, took a more leadership administrative role in my academic career, uh, I was a professor of business and society and of strategic management. And really my research um, has consistently sought to understand uh, the influences on and impacts of firm strategic choices when it comes to issues around CSR, sustainability, environmental management, and, and so on. And that's hopefully what gives me some relevance and some insight to, to today's conversation. My work essentially has sought consistently to understand what motivates and encourages firms to improve their social environmental performance, what capabilities and considerations shape uh, firm strategies in that regard, and what implications any strategic choices that firms make have for reputation, for performance, uh, and more broadly for stakeholder relationships. And I think that has a lot of resonance with, uh, with many of the, the, the papers today. Uh, within that work, uh, my work, uh, and indeed the work of the field, uh, an interest in multinational firms has always been very prominent, if not as well articulated and teased out as it might be. And I'm really glad that this cluster of three, I think, really excellent studies, I think, significantly advances what we know about CSR in the context of the multinational enterprise. Um, multinational companies are fascinating for these kinds of questions because of their uh, scale and scope uh, because of their uh, you know, novel organizational structures and control problems, uh, because of the varied capabilities and capacities they have, as well as, of course, um, variation in their home and host country environments that brings a significant complexity to the navigation of uh, social and environmental issues at the firm level. Um, those normative and regulatory uh, in influences that I'm sure a couple of people will be talking about relatively shortly, I think, uh, and conflicts between them, I think, uh, provide for uh, um, really quite uh, theoretically uh, in policy terms and in practice terms uh, significant complexity in, in what determines how multinationals behave and how we see them behave in relation to their social and environmental performance. These issues therefore make studying multinationals and social environmental performance really fascinating, important for us as a community of scholars, but also important for policymakers and those sat in organisations making organization wide scope decisions uh, in relation to these kinds of issues that I think makes the contributions we're about to hear from all the more notable that that underlying complexity to the nature of the question. Reflecting that, uh, today's overarching question, the question we're going to spend some time uh, engaging with, uh, is how do multinational enterprises manage divergent pressures for social and environmental practices around the world? And we have um, within that three studies, I think, that look at fascinating slices through that problem. Um, with that, without further ado, it's a, it's a real pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, and I can show you his paper because I've got it here. Uh, I'm really glad that we have uh, Bill Newbury with us. Um, Bill's going to present a paper uh, entitled The Grass is Always Greener, the Impact of Home and Host Country CSR Reputation Signaling. Uh, on cross-country investments. This is a collaboration uh, um, with Luis Alfonso Dow and with uh, Elizabeth Moore. And with that, I'll just hand over to you, Bill, and ask you to uh, give us an overview of your study. Uh Okay, so, so thank you, Steve. Uh, so, you know, and, and thank you, uh, Claus uh, and Timothy, for organizing this seminar. I'm uh, very happy to present on behalf of my co authors, uh, Luis and Elizabeth. Uh, and this is a paper uh, we've been working on for a few years and was just published in Journal of International Business Policy. And we're very grateful for the editors at JIBP and the reviewers for giving us you know, fantastic comments that helped us improve the paper as it went through the publication process. Uh, the title, as you know, Steve just said, is about the, the grass is always greener, and we're looking at basically CSR reputation signaling from the home and the host country, and how it impacts country-level patterns in cross-country investments. 
So just to make sure it's clear before I go through the more details, uh, this is a country level study. We examined basically 25, a little over 25,000 cross country pairs in 153 countries over the period uh, 2004 to 2011. And we're basically looking out how the, the factor of host country CSR reputation signaling impacts these investment patterns. Uh, so just a couple of important concepts before I get into the hypotheses of the paper. Uh, first of all, we want to talk about, you know, why we think CSR reputation signaling is important. Uh, first of all, we know from recent literature in, you know, uh, international business that FDI decisions are, you know, they're increasingly impacted by country characteristics, either of the home country or the host country. Uh, and uh, we know these characteristics imprint on their firms. Uh, and they can either facilitate or discourage FDI in a country uh, by a firm in a, firms in a country uh, by giving, you know, we have the literature on country origin effects, which basically says, you know, certain countries are known for this, so other countries are known for that. And this helps the, the firms in the country collectively invest in other places. Uh, country CSR is in particular is increasingly recognized as an important characteristic for firms, particularly you know, with the growing focus of sustainability and global initiatives, uh, you know, uh, which with the sustainable development goals by the United Nations, you know, this is really believed to be you know, an important characteristic that is looked at from firms when they invest in other countries. And so a country's firms can collectively benefit from the CSR reputations of their home countries. We also bring two theoretical perspectives into our analysis. We start with institutional theory, and as you know, Steve kind of mentioned his inter introduction within institutional theory. While you know the regulatory portion has been more concentrated on in IB research, uh, we believe the normative element really becomes important when we look at CSR uh, because it refers to social obligations and behaviors as being appropriate. And you know the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as I mentioned, you know, pressure firms to engage in ethical business practices, and these pre these pressures basically are normatively driven. To that, we add the concept of diffuse reciprocity, and this I have to thank you know our co-author Elizabeth, who comes from the political science area, uh, and you know diffuse reciprocity is a you know uh, a theory in political science in the broader area of what's called regime theory, that it basically looks at how you know actors make decisions regarding collective action and work together in order to achieve some kind of balance and social exchange. So, so diffuse reciprocity isn't out, you know, I do something and you have to give me exactly the same thing back. So it's not like a necessary a one to one direct exchange, but it says, you know, the group of actors working as a whole, uh, they do things to help the group. Uh, in this case, you know, the sustainable development goals or CSR. And other actors in the group will make corresponding things, but it's not necessarily A and B direct directly, but everybody works as a whole to make the collective better. Uh, it focuses on normal and moral exchanges and basically uh, leads to you know, mutual actions that basically produce benefits for all. And we think it extends institutional theory by emphasizing the reciprocal nature and the reciprocal relationship between countries and their institutions. Uh, so since we have, you know, limited time, I'm going to go do the three hypotheses real quickly. Uh, the first hypothesis in the paper, basically we look at, you know, the home country CSR signaling. So we basically says, you know, the home country, if your country, companies in your country are known uh, for having, you know, better uh, environmental practices, better CSR, uh, this reputation of the, C, the home country for CSR prints on the firms. And this gives firms from a country a collect an advantage that helps them when they invest overseas. So the idea with this hypothesis is, you know, the greater the home country CSR signaling in a country, uh, the, the, it will have a positive effect on their ability to invest overseas. Uh, their investments will be more welcomed in other countries, and this will increase, you know, the amount of foreign direct investment between any given home and home host country. Uh, the second hypothesis, now we look at, you know, the distance or the relationship between two countries. So this hypothesis basically says, you know, uh, and just building on diffuse reciprocity theory, uh, you know, the more differences between the countries, uh, the more, you know, the collective can benefit from these uh, 
exchanges between them. So it's it's different than many theories in the traditional IV area, which emphasize that you know when a country A invests in another country, for example, the U.S. might invest in the U.K. because they're similar in culture, they're similar you know in economic development levels. Here, it's basically saying though know, in certain areas, you know, differences matter, uh, and they promote you know, investment between countries. And here we say, you know, when there's a higher CSR reputation difference, uh, this is gonna increase investment. For firms coming from the higher, higher rated CSR country or the higher reputation CSR country, this gives their firms an advantage, a greater advantage when they're investing in countries with lower CSR. But we think the same thing happens on the other direction. You know, if a country has a lower CSR reputation, its firms, based on your know, diffuse reciprocity principle, may be attracted to firms, countries with higher reputations, because by you know investing in these countries, this gives the firms legitimacy and it helps these firms and their corresponding countries raise their overall reputations. Uh, and so, also firms with you know from a lower CSR reputation would benefit from going to a higher CSR reputation country. And so that's that's hypothesis two. Uh, hypothesis three basically now looks at an economic distance moderator. And basically say, you know, this, this is all well and good, uh, but, you know, uh, when the, econo the economy of a country is doing better, uh, this creates conditions that are more favorable for a firm, uh, for firms within its country to benefit from cross-country CSR differentials. So if a country is just, you know, barely uh, surviving or, you know, the, the economy is not good, we, we suggest, you know, that people are going to, uh, and people in firms in the country are going to, you know, pay less attention to CSR. But when the home country is, you know, doing much better, uh, the, the CSR differentials are going to matter more. So, so we also think there's going to be a positive moderating effect of the CSR reputation signaling distance relationship uh, on FDI. Uh, so uh, the conclusions, uh, I'm gonna skip to just state real briefly, all three hypotheses were supported. Uh, uh, the, I left out the, uh, the uh, statistical analyses just for time, but you can read them in the paper. We had lots of control variables, uh, lots of different you know, alternative analyses, right? And the, the results seem very robust. Uh, we think we contribute to the FDI literature by adding the concept of home country CSR. Uh, we also think we uh, introduced a diffuse reciprocity literature from international relations into the IB field to augment you know, institutional theory as a more commonly used theory in this literature. And we add to the country reputation dialogue, uh, specifically by uh, addressing country CSR reputation, which again, you know, country reputation is a relatively understudied you know, phenomenon in the international business field. Uh, in terms of future research, we think there's lots of opportunities to extend this, uh, examining alternate dimensions of CSR signaling, such as reporting from third party agencies. Uh, we can employ other measures of CSR activity uh, to complement our research, and we could extend the relationship study within this manuscript. You know, uh, we use, you know, internationalization is basically the dependent variable in this moderate, in this manuscript, but we think we also might be a, a more longitudinal study to look at, you know, how does CSR reputation impact, you know, cross-border invest, cross investment, and ultimately, how does that impact the ultimate sustainable development of a country, uh, which is one of the major goals of, you know, the sustainable development goals of the UN. Uh, so thank you very much for allowing me to present, and I think I will turn it back over to Steve. Wonderful. Thank you, Bill, and, and I'm very much uh, appreciate you keeping to time quite so wonderfully. I, I just, I've just been on the Q&A function. I haven't seen a question from anyone yet, so I'm just sort of reiterating the opportunity to people that Zoom has a wonderful, uh, a wonderful Q&A function and do, do begin as uh, the presentations happen to, uh, to ask questions in there that then uh, after we've heard from our three um, uh, three papers, four speakers, that um, we'll, we'll begin to open that up to Q&A. So, so that opportunity is there. Thank you, Bill. So now it's a real pleasure to um, 
to uh, introduce uh, Andrew Inkpen and Julia Hartman. And again, their wonderful study is here. This is, um, this is forthcoming uh, in Jibs. Uh, title of the study is Different Shades of Green, Global Oil and Gas Companies and Ren Renewable Energy. And I think it's a, it's a really fascinating study and I, I'd recommend it to, to everyone. Um, I know that Andrew and Julia are going to uh, tag team the presentation between them. I think Andrew has the presentation, so he will share his screen momentarily and then and then the two of them will back and forth through the presentation. So uh, welcome and thank you, Andrew and Julia. You're on mute, Andrew. And Andrew, yeah, now, but now you have to share again, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So let, let me just give you a quick background on how this study came about. Uh, Conan and I have both worked for several decades pretty closely with the oil and gas sector. And Julia is our sustainability expert. So we, we, you know, we observed that some oil and gas companies are starting to invest in renewable energy and while, while others are not. So we had a, a fairly straightforward question. You know, why, why are some oil and gas firms proactively changing their competitive do domains to include more renewable energy resources while others continue to maintain a distinct kind of fossil fuels focus? And you know, we're both convinced that, you know, we're all convinced that the energy transition is happening and we will over the coming decades shift away from fossil fuels. And the question is, what, what are oil and gas firms going to do? Are they going to stay with their, you know, with their historical kind of fossil fuel focus or will they shift? And it, it's, you know, it's, it seems like a pretty obvious question, but the challenge we had was you know, really trying to understand inside the companies what, what they're trying to do. So you know, our kind of dependent variable is you know, what we call management commitment. Uh, you know, what, what is the commitment of managers to really invest in renewable energy. And we define that as kind of a willingness to allocate resources and, and, and champion activities. And you know, I guess we had a, an internal debate uh, with the team as to whether or not we were really studying, let's say corporate social responsibility or are we, are we simply studying strategy and strategic choice? And I'm not sure that less, the team necessarily has a, has a, has a common view on this. Um, but the question is, we think a very interesting one. Why, why are some firms you know, shifting their domains and why are other firms uh, sticking with, with fossil fuels and, and not really investing at all in renewable energy? So the, the, the framework, the theoretical framework really has kind of two, two, two levels, if you will. It, you know, from, from institutional theory, we have a set of country level variables. Um, and a regulative, pr regulative pressure, sort of what's happening in the country that perhaps is, is through regulation is pushing companies to, to be more involved in renewables. Uh, normative social pressure. Uh, you no, know, we know that there's some differences between some European countries and, and certainly the US, uh, Russia, some Asian countries. And, and then hydrocarbon reserves, the, 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 the kind of the argument that a country that is has, has significant hydrocarbon reserves, the country, the companies in those countries will be less, perhaps less likely to, to, you know, to make that shift. And then we have a set of firm level factors, uh, environmental citizenship, uh, you know, the degree to which the company seems to be uh, you know, a good environmental citizen, uh, what we call captive consumption, which is you know, some, some, some companies actually have quite extensive renewable energy investments internally to actually run, you know, to run the fossil fuel business. So, you know, there's the argument that, well, if they're gaining experience internally, that should perhaps be pushing them to, to make investments um, in, in the renewable energy markets. And then internationalization with, with the argument that, that, you know, international firms are going to be more exposed to what's happening around the world. Um, and, and, and perhaps, you know, there's quite a, close link between that and obviously the country level variables. Um, so we had these two sets of variables and 
we, we built a data set that involved the, includes the world's kind of largest oil and gas companies. And we, we chose somewhat arbitrarily, we chose the top 90, uh, which spans 33 different countries. We had to restrict the type of companies because there's, you know, the oil and gas company is a pretty, oil and gas, gas industry is a quite a complicated value chain. So we chose integrated companies, you know, upstream, downstream companies. We chose E&P companies that are, you know, involved mainly in the upstream. We chose refining and marketing, storage and transport. We excluded trading companies. We excluded petrochemical companies. Um, so we tried to keep it within the bounds of companies that are very involved in upstream, really to the downstream, but not beyond the downstream into petrochemicals and further processing. And let's go, I'll hand it over to you, Julia, to talk about results. Thank, thank you, Andrew. So um, analyzing the data was a little bit of a challenge because our dependent variable, the top management team commitment to renewable energy was uh, quite difficult to, to capture. So we actually spent some time in developing a coding scheme to analyze, uh, um, analyze the information that is given in companies' annual reports. Um, that coding scheme, so we developed it over a couple of months. We iteratively tested it on, uh, on the annual report data. And why did we choose that measure? Well, first, there is no data repository of oil and gas companies' true investments into renewable energy. Um, second problem, even if there were, it would be necessarily, uh, you would have to adjust such a measure for um, investments that those companies do in, in traditional oil and gas assets. So we just lacked this one. Um, now, the way in which we approached this measure by collecting information from the annual reports, which is um, an important communication instrument of those oil and gas companies towards their um, customers and shareholders, um, actually gave us some confidence that what the companies would write in there would also be something that they pursue on. So essentially, we, we have a count measure here. So we try to find incidences, evidences of uh, commitment to renewable energy. So for instance, we looked uh, and sought to identify if a company operated uh, a wind park or a solar plant, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a count um, distribution of the dependent variable. And at the same time, you see this here on this slide, uh, our um, independent variables are measured at two levels. Some of them are measured at the country level, others at the firm level. So to analyze the data, we actually had to recur to our multi-level Poisson regression model. Um, and um, the results are sort of summarized on this chart here. So the dashed lines are actually uh, paths that are insignificant whereas the regular lines are a significant part. So we could actually find support for four of our hypotheses, namely that TMT commitment is driven by the context uh, in terms of the regulative pressure that companies experience and in terms of the normative social pressure in a country. However, we also assumed that hydrocarbon reserves in a country would uh, lead managers um, to actually invest less in the renewable energy. So the assumption here was that in hydrocarbon rich countries, uh, managers would be less pressurized towards um, renewable energy, so they would do less. This hypothesis was not confirmed, so that seemingly does not play a role in those decisions. Then uh, regarding the firm level factors, we actually found uh, significant effects of environmental practices, so sort of uh, companies' ex, um, uh, attitudes, positive attitudes towards an environmental management that was uh, supportive and of internationalization. So the more international the companies are, the higher is uh, the probability they, that they would invest in renewable energy. Captive consumption, quite surprisingly, was not significant. So it seems that those companies that have actually experienced some internal um, uh, learnings from renewable energy do not leverage this for market purposes, which is quite a bit surprising. So these are the results. We can now move on to um, the next steps in the journey, if you wish. So what do we do now? Um, so our research has 
some flaws in a sense. So uh, the data that um, are included in this paper here are cross-sectional, um, but we also want to look a little bit more into time trends. So we are currently about to expand the database and look more into longer term aspects. Uh, we have not included national oil companies in this analysis for the simple reason that they don't publish standardized annual reports. Um, but we are searching for ways to include those companies as well. Um, we also try to develop a more quantitative measure of environmental performance. So, for instance, by looking into emissions performance relative to some, um, uh, some financial measure. Um, because that would give us some indication as to how good are they really in reducing the carbon emissions that they um, produce. And uh, we also look a little bit into focusing the industry more closely. So we had previously included um, transportation, upstream, downstream integrated companies, and we actually found that probably renewable energy is more important for a few of those ones. So we will concentrate on those ones. Um, what we also found is so uh, we differentiated two types of TMT commitment. One was uh, the strategic depth. Yeah, so is there really a mission? Is there a strategy behind this? Or is it just an accumulation um, of different types of renewable energy that those companies would invest into? So um, companies that say they have a strategy but don't invest into wind energy, geothermal or any other energy, they would be rather um, symbolic in their in their attempts to renewable energy. So we tried to go deeper into those ones. We found quite a few of those ones that actually said they would do, but then have no investments in, in real plants. Um, and then there had been a few companies that actually had actually tried renewable energies, but then left the field again. So it's interesting to see why. So why did some of those ones go into renewables, but then decide to divest from this again? So we also plan to do some qualitative studies on those ones. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. I'll just mention po bullet point number four. Uh, one of the, I guess, also limitations of the study is that we do have a set of companies that, that are both integrated companies and independents and, and sort of your play companies in the different parts of the industry. And we didn't, we really need to look a little more deeply at what's happening with the, you know, with the industry focus relative to renewables, because the part of the industry that is the most threatened is the upstream. And you know that the midstream and the downstream may well deal with the transition if there is some other, you know, type of you know, renewable energy liquid that goes into the into the downstream. So the upstream that actually explore and produce oil and gas are, are by far the most threatened in the transition. And we didn't really pull out the different elements of strategy in our study. So I think that's a very critical future piece of research that that you know that, that should be very interesting to look at. So so thank you. Uh, I guess back to, back to you, Steve. Yeah, thanks very much. Th thanks both for the presentation and again for being so uh, timely and thoughtful uh, on uh, on timings, uh, making sure that we keep plenty of time for conversation, which I'm happy to say we're beginning to get uh, reasonably large numbers of questions. So so keep them coming, please, please, gang. Um, uh, next, I'd like to introduce um, Nan Zhou, who is presenting uh, her paper with... Uh, Heli Wangs, uh, as you'll see from the uh, from the screen sharing, um, the title is "Foreign Subsidiary CSR as a Buffer Against Parent Firm Reputational Risk," uh, and this is uh, again an another paper that is um, uh, accepted and on early view at, at Jibs, and, and I'd recommend it very highly. So, we welcome Nan from Beijing. This is a truly global uh, get together. Um, Nan, over to you. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Zhong Nan from uh, Nankai University in China. And uh, first, I want to thank uh, Steve Cross and uh, uh, team for organizing this event. I think it's a great, great opportunity for us to share our latest res results. So our paper is about uh, uh, foreign subsidiaries, SR, how foreign firms uh, mitigate the negative impact of a crisis spillover from their parent firm. So actually, the idea of this paper comes from a real life event. I'm not sure whether you still remember the McDonald's ice cream machine crisis, which happened about three years ago. So on July the 14th, 2017, a Nick, a teenage boy uh, working in McDonald's Louisiana store, posted disgusting 
photos of ice cream machines at uh, uh, on Twitter. And actually he offered to clean up these machines, but the manager said, just uh, leave it as is. So, 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 so it seems that it's a common practice for McDonald's to have such dirty ice cream machines. So um, uh, until uh, by July the 26th, the next tweet has been retweeted like more than 14,000 times, but till then it's a crisis for McDonald's in, in the United States. But on the same day, uh, uh, a Chinese media outlet picked up this story and translated it into Chinese. And uh, immediately all the Chinese media picked up this uh, story as well and it really become a very big news in China. So everybody in China is starting to question McDonald's China, whether you are using the uh, same ice cream machine. Uh, so McDonald's China kind of panicked. So on the, on the same day at night, they released a statement saying that, okay, we know what is happening and now we are looking into this. And on the next day, they released, uh, I think I have this, uh, there, 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 a news release saying that, okay, our stock price didn't fall and uh, this are all false news. And also our uh, China, McDonald China, our ice cream uh, machine are very clean. So this kind of a very good example of how crisis happened in the, in the parent firm negatively influenced the operations of a foreign, foreign subsidiary in the, in the, in the, in the host country. So this is how we, we get the idea. So we just uh, want to look at uh, what, what is uh, the academic literature uh, saying about this. So now let's turn to the academic literature on headquarters subsidiary relationship. I think most of the study, they focus on the positive side of the impact of parent firm to foreign subsidiary. Like foreign subsidiaries, subsidiaries benefit from parent firm. They receive knowledge, technology, brand, and capital, all the good things they receive. So it's like a, a child inherited a fortune from their parents. But there are also bad things that uh, children can get from their parents, right? So it's like, if your parents are bought, then you get that as well. So. We kind of, in this paper, want to shift the focus from the positive side to the negative impact of uh, parent firm uh, has on the on foreign subsidiaries. So this is a kind of the, the background of the, of the paper. We just don't want to look at how uh, firms, foreign subsidiary, mitigate such kind of crisis over from the parent firm. So now, so what is unique about crisis over from parent firm? So crisis over, there's a literature on it and there's already many studies on it. So what is unique about crisis over from parent firm and why do we need to study them? So here in this paper, we argue that, well, crisis over from parent firm to foreign subsidiary is unique and particularly strong for three reasons. First is the high visibility of multinationals. Right? So the parent firm, they are mostly the Fortune 500 at least in our some of the very large multinationals. So they operate under the scrutiny of the public and the media. So this high visibility makes it very likely that anything bad happens in one place, the, the people in the in the foreign country will know it. So that's the number one reason why is uh, the spillover effect is quite strong in our context. Second one is there's a strong headquarters subsidiary link. So subsidiaries are part of or are often managed or controlled by their parent firms, right? So, so it's really like a, a parent and a, a children. So, so, so if something bad happened to the, to the parent firm, people will naturally assume that the same thing is happening in the, in the parent firm as well. After all, you are the same company. Right? So this is the second reason. And the third reason is the liability of foreigners. So stakeholders in the host countries they have limited or even best understanding of their foreign subsidiaries because this, uh, this is something happening in a, in a foreign country. So they have limited Im information. And uh, moreover, when uh, they receive the information, it could be biased if uh, the language is interpreted and if the media has some kind of uh, tendency to interpret the, the, the in a negative way. So that will exaggerate the, the, the negative impact of the crisis. So these three, reasons really uh, uh, contributed to the very strong crisis we over from kind of from the foreign subsidiary. And more importantly, the traditional tactic firms use to mitigate the crisis we over, which is a detachment tactic, will not work in our context. Uh, so in detachment technique, the firm is just saying that, okay, 
I am not related to that firm in crisis at all. So we are very different. But it will not work for the for our context because first, as we already said, the link from uh, between the headquarters and the subsidiary is very strong. So even though you say that you are different from your parents, so how many people will leave your statement? After all, you are you are from the same you are the same company, right? and uh, moreover. Even if uh, a foreign subsidiary could really detach from the uh, kind of firm, they may not want to do so because they rely on their parent for critical resources like the capital, like the, the knowledge. So, so even though they, they, they could, they don't want. So the traditional detachment technique didn't work. So what should a foreign subsidiary do to mitigate such negative impact? So our paper just proposed that, okay, in this uh, in this case, if something bad happened in your at your parent, so uh, foreign subsidiary could engage in the subsidiary CSR in the host country to really to, to mitigate such uh, reputation risk spillover or crisis spillover. So our main hypothesis is just uh, the relationship between parent firm reputation risk and the level of uh, subsidiary CSR. The higher the parent firm reputation risk, meaning that there's a high probability of crisis spillover from parent firm. So the, 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 the subsidiary needs to conduct the CSR. So CSR could not only uh, serve as a kind of uh, ex ante to prevent the, 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 the crisis spillover to happen, because if you do a lot of CSR, so the, the local stakeholders have some moral capital on you. And so when something bad happens, so they may think that, okay, you may, you may be really different from your, your, your parent firm because you have done so many good things in our, in our country. So we believe in you. So maybe it will, prevent the uh, crisis spillover to happen. And uh, the second second way to, to, to really reduce this negative impact is really, even though uh, after a crisis spillover happened, so it will result in the loss of social legitimacy of the foreign subsidiary in the host country. And then the subsidiary CSR could really uh, build uh, social legitimacy, which could compensate for the loss of uh, uh, social legitimacy. Uh, due to the crisis over. So, so this is uh, about our main hypothesis of the relationship between parent firm reputation risk and the level of subsidiary CSR. And to lend more credit to our arguments, we examine a set of uh, moderators. So uh, as, as we, we said earlier, so there are three factors driving the, the, the crisis over from uh, parent firm to the subsidiary. The high visibility of multinational, the strong, uh, headquarters subsidiary link and the level of liability foreigners. So we choose our moderators uh, according to whether they can affect one or more than one of these three factors. For example, uh, take subsidiary A, for example. So uh, subsidiary A is really as uh, it reduces the kind of, kind of reduces the, the link between uh, between uh, foreign uh, subsidiary and its parent because as uh, as a subsidiary grow older and older, so they rely less on their parent firm for different resources. So the link naturally uh, become uh, a weakened. And also subsidiary age uh, reduces the level of liability to foreign is a uh, 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 foreign subsidiary face because uh, they can learn how to operate in uh, host country. So, 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 so for sub foreign sub uh, subsidiary age reduces the, 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 the chances of crisis to be over. So it, weakens the, 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 the main effect between parent firm reputation risk and the level of subsidiary CSR. So, so all our other uh, moderators are more or less the same. They, they influence one or two out of the three uh, factors which drives the crisis over from parent firm to the foreign subsidiary. So this is our conceptual model. And we test uh, this uh, model in the in a sample of large uh, multina multinational uh, subsidiary in China during a period of about uh, eight or two, nine years. So, and find support for most of our hypothesis. So this is, uh, this is uh, pretty much about our, uh, our paper. And now let's, uh, let's focus on the bigger picture a little bit. I think there's, uh, there's a consensus that uh, the environment is becoming more and more hostile for multinationals in, uh, in recent years. Uh, uh, for different reasons. And first one, I think, is uh, stakeholder power in the host country is increasing. So, so, so take China, for example. So it's 30 years ago when foreign uh, companies come to invest in China. So we, we really just like, expect them to bring uh, uh, employment and uh, possibly technology. 
now we have higher and higher expectations for them. We want them to really to lead in, uh, in, in terms of CSR. And uh, so, so this kind of uh, stakeholder power uh, increasing really make it uh, hard, harder for, uh, for, for, for multinationals to operate in the host country in terms of uh, CSR. They have to do more. And also the information technology is developing of it makes it uh, so easy that uh, crisis in one country spread to the other part of the world. So it's really, uh, and then multinational needs to be very careful what they do in, in, in any part of the world. And also this uh, rising trend of deglobalization contributes to the, the, the difficulty as well. I think the, the spread of the uh, COVID-19 just intensified this, uh, this kind of trend of deglobalization which makes uh, multinationals suffer more. So given uh, this uh, hostile uh, environment, I think it's uh, safe to conclude that multinationals are now facing increasing a liability of foreign is not decreasing. So now here I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of my earlier work, I think it's, uh, it has a uh, relevance to, to this topic as well. It's just in this paper, talk sorry. about- Sorry for being uh, that guy right now, but I think- <laughs> round up the discussion, some of the issues you're raising right now might come up again in, in the questions. I'd like to hand over back okay. to Steve to manage the Q&A, and I'm sure some mm -hmm. of the issues you still have in your pipeline, you might get an opportunity to ask during the Q&A. Steve. Yeah, th okay. thank you, Klaus. Um, uh, and thank you, Nan, for, I think, mm -hmm. presenting a really fascinating paper. Uh, questions have started to come through really quite nicely, thick and fast, and, and thank you to, to colleagues who have already begun to respond to some of the, the more direct ones uh, through the chat. I might open uh, an initial question up to, to each of you. Um, one of the things that's interesting, and it's a bit of a theme in the questions from, for example, Sarah Ku, Astrid Saltzman, one or two others, is really about the methodological challenges of exploring robustly uh, how multinationals are dealing with um, uh, social environmental issues. Can you just give a bit of an insight into you know, what, what you thought about in the context of your paper and what in general you see as the uh, challenges to doing more research on multinationals and social responsibility. So maybe if I hand that start to uh, Bill. Okay, uh, no, excellent question, Steve. Uh, and this does relate to, I think there are several questions in the chat about this. Uh, you know, for our paper, we basically use, you know, the, the number of firms in a country uh, that were members of the UN Global Content Compact, you know, has an indication that you know, at a country level, you know, how much support for CSR, global CSR initiatives there were in the country. Uh, we had, did adjust that for, I think, by the population of the country. So it wasn't just the absolute number, but, you know, an adjusted number. But th this is how we captured it. But this is, you know, definitely something uh, that we thought about, you know, what, it's a difficult thing to measure, right? You know, what's the CSR reputation of a country? How do you measure this? And, you know, we chose the, that measure just because it's something that, you know, it's a, a compact that's globally available. So, yeah, and it's something that's being emphasized, not just in developed countries, but also in many developing countries. So what it is kind of, kind of a measure that has broad cross-cultural applicability. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can keep going on, but maybe I should yeah, allow the I others think, to reply. <laughs> I, th I think it, you know, one of the things I think is interesting, you know, there's a there's an interesting methodological issue around kind of units and levels of analysis as well. I think get to some of those measurement issues and and prov provoke different kinds of me measurement challenges. J Julia or Andrew, do you want to come in on the challenges of doing kind of robust work on environment and CSR in the context of multinationals? Yeah, we had quite some challenges, <laughs> evidently. So uh, it was really so um, in the paper in the end that doesn't appear very much, but um, this, you know, working through the annual reports and trying to find a good measure that is valid and, and gives a good idea of what those companies are really doing has been quite some hard work. So I think it took us more than more than half a year, if I remember correctly, to develop that. And, and we had the challenge that we had annual reports from different countries as well. So um, Indian annual reports tend to be very elaborate, very flourishy in, in the language. And then you had those American reports, which were very straight to the point, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually, so we, we, we developed a coding scheme, then we independently started to code the annual reports. And then we had to come together several times to figure out how do we overcome all those differences and challenges. I think the solution that the, we had in the end was a very good one. 
Um, and I just mentioned this once in the chat. So we actually tried to capture this TMT commitment in two different ways. One was more a strategic way. So what do those companies really put in their mission statement? Do they have a clear strategy behind this? Do they show some research and development into renewables? The other one was really counting, you know, the wind farms and the solar plants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and by this, we were actually able to correlate the two and see if what, what those companies are saying is really what they are also doing. And luckily, we had a quite strong correlation of the two and a significant one. So it seems that most companies actually do what they say they are doing. But that has been a challenge of getting there. Um, so I think all of us would agree to that. And we are well aware that the oil and gas industry, you know, the, the investments in renewable energy are not necessarily the same thing as corporate social responsibility behavior. And we, we you know, the, this is one industry that has been accused for many years of, of, of greenwashing. Uh, I mean, BP is the, the prime candidate, uh, you know, uh, beyond petroleum, it, it, it never happened. Uh, so, so we're, you know, we're, we're aware of that. And, and, you know, a challenge is really trying to understand behaviors. And that is, that is a real challenge for us. We, we, we could measure actions, but we're struggling with the, the behavioral sort of side of things and what companies are really doing and, and what do they want, you know, what do they intend to do? And we, we've actually just written a proposal for another journal uh, uh, that takes a pretty hard look at, if we, if we write the paper, a pretty hard look at this sort of behavioral question yeah i think i think that's really useful i, I do think the the substantive symbolic kind of issue when it comes to what's underpinning firm behaviors in in this context i think is um uh, is really interesting we'll come back to now Nan, a comment uh, from you on on the challenges of exploring um methodologically uh tackling csr in the context of multinational firms Yes, I think for our paper, the challenge is that uh, we focus on subsidiary, which do not really usually issue CSR report as their parent firm. So, so we searched uh, like widely, but uh, luckily we are able to find some uh, local agency who release a, a like kind of report on the subsidiary level of CSR. So my, 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 my understanding is that I think uh, in this age, there are information all over the place. You just need to really find out and then uh, merge them together to, to compare your, your your big data set. Yeah. Yeah, I think that. Thank you, Nan. That kind of addresses some of. Uh, you know, is a question from from Alan Breinholt on online around around how Nan captures subsidiary level um, CSR in her data, and the answer to that, Alan, in a nutshell, is a is a locally relatively widely accepted survey that's was published is published annually for, for a period of time that that gives nan i think a relatively unique data source for uh, for subsidiary csr because otherwise that's pretty difficult to access uh, and another question that again kind of draws across a range of uh, a range of people's uh, questions so i'm looking at um uh, some of the stuff from alan from catherine from from marina uh, reputation plays a pretty significant role in one way or another you could say all three of your all three of your stuff is, you know, in oil and gas, you've got a sort of reputationally tainted sector. And so understanding what goes on there against that backdrop, I think is quite interesting. For Bill, you've got reputation as a country level phenomenon that then uh, shapes uh, aggregate firm behavioral outcomes. And for you, Nan, the, the, you've got a sort of reputational cascade whereby um, whereby uh, subsidiaries are seeking to distance themselves or respond to reputational threats at, at higher levels of aggregation. I wonder if you'd each say something around um, contrasting, if you like, you know, highlighting the role of reputation potentially in your analysis and speculating a bit on, on why reputation might be important and or what the limitations to reputation and considerations around reputation are uh, in your analysis. So so maybe again, I'll start with you, Bill. Uh, yeah, so no, this is an you know, uh, excellent question. You know, and I know Arena had a question directly about you know the multiple levels of reputation, uh, and I think you know this is an area that's really not very well studied. 
Uh, in terms of country reputation, you know, there, there's only a handful of people doing work in that area. You know, Steve is one of them. Uh, I remember, you know, in two, 2012, Oxford published a handbook on corporate reputation, and he was one of the reviewers of the chapter, uh, you know, that I wrote on country reputation for that for that book. And, you know, the, the still there's not many people examining country aspects of reputation and particularly in the international business literature in general and so i think there's a lot of room for multi-level modeling here uh, which hasn't been done hardly at all in terms of you know what's a differential effect of country reputation versus firm reputation versus a subsidiary reputation and how do these you know factors interrelate to each other uh, and so I know it's it's a very important topic area that hasn't gotten enough re enough attention yet. And I think you know I would encourage people to work in this area because there are certainly halo effects. There's also effects that need to be considered when these things don't align. So a country may have a great reputation, but if you're an outlier firm in that country that's doing terrible things, or vice versa, your country may have a terrible reputation. Uh, but you as a firm are doing great things with respect to CSR. How do you overcome that negative halo from the country and distinguish yourself uh, and break out of you know, the country reputation cycle uh, and become well, well known? When we know that you know, being known helps with this. So firms that are better known in the environment can escape their country reputation more easily, but it's still you know, a question that hasn't been researched enough and is, I think, becoming increasingly more important as, you know, the examples that uh, the other two papers co-authors brought out in their studies. You know, this, this is this is important stuff that's becoming increasingly uh, well recognized. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I mean, for you, for you, Andrew and Julia, you know, perhaps skew, skew the question towards, you know, you have, I think, a sector that most people would see as sort of reputationally questionable in some ways, particularly when it comes to uh, social and environmental conduct. I wonder what the, how you think about the consequences for your analysis or the implications for your findings potentially and or your future work of um, of operating fundamentally in this in this tainted sector where 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 if you like publics are skeptical around motivation and and really why firms are uh, are seeking to to build environmental credentials maybe i'll i'll let julia talk about the sort of maybe the research implications and methodological implications. I guess I would challenge you a little bit, Steve, when you say reputation tainted, that's a, that's a country level perspective. Uh, there are parts of the world where this industry is not reputation tainted. Uh, you know, in the Middle East, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, this is not, even in Canada where I'm currently sitting, uh, the in industry has a very different reputation than perhaps in the United States, in the UK, in Germany. So. It, it, and I think as Bill mentioned, reputation depends on, on many different factors and, and there are, this industry has very different reputations depending on what country you're in. I mean, in Russia, I don't think it's particularly tainted. Um, and, and, and so I think we have to be a little careful to say, you know, give it a, uh, you know, a broad brush and say it's a reputation tainted industry. Uh, it really depends on where you are in the world. Um, and, and, and we know that there are European companies doing things with renewable energy because of normative social pressures that do not exist in some of these other countries. So, um, but going forward, I think uh, there are some real challenges and some interesting questions. Julia? Yes, in terms of, of going forward, I, I'm, I agree with Andrew that uh, this idea of reputation is very di difficult to capture for the oil and gas industry, but there might be some other factors that maybe replace the driver uh, reputation. One of those ones could be regulation. So, uh, there will be more and more regulation coming in that contains uh, carbon emissions. The other one that we're currently observing is investor behavior. And sometimes this is also driven by, by regulation. So some in some countries, financial investors now need to show and document that they support companies with a higher environmental, social and governance performance. And that holds also for, for oil companies. Um, and, and the question is, so what do we see there? The problem for oil and gas is the time horizon. So those assets that they own, they have been accumulated over decades, and it is, it's just not possible to, you know, to make a, a, a quick transition. So 
time is a big factor. And I think most of our, our models right now are unable to tap into this. So that, that's also the reason why we said we do this in the long run. That's, I, t I take the point about taint. I think that is somewhat in the, at the eye of the beholder. I think that's absolutely right. I, I wonder whether you got very substantial country effects in your analysis for that reason, in a sense, because that would pick up those different kind of normative um, interpretations of the industry that then might filter, as you say, Julia, into, um, into differences in firm behaviour. Uh, Nan, do you, do you want to comment on, I mean, I think one of the things that's notable about, about your, you know, if Bill is looking at reputation, you know, at a, as a country aggregate level, you could see uh, for Julia and Andrew, there's something going on at industry level as an industry collective reputation, a commons effect maybe, and there may be again kind of differences in that interpretation. The thing I think is notable about yours is, is the intra-firm dynamics that come from reputation that, that actually reputation at the corporate level casts a shadow or a halo on other aspects of what what the operating units of the firm do do you want to say a little bit about about how you think about reputation in your analysis and, it, and its centrality to those intra-firm dynamics yes uh, reputation is definitely very important in, in our study because actually our title is about the reputation risk spillover. Actually, in the in writing the paper, we we have a, a comment from the reviewer saying, "Like, why do you look at reputation risk? So because there's actually you are you are seeing about crisis of spill spillover. So I think reputation is actually you know way better than crisis spillover because crisis when we do the, uh, look at that is mostly a single event like right? we look at the stock performance before and after for three or five days but the reputation is a really accumulative thing so i think it more captures uh, the, the, the really what uh, firm is do during a uh, longer period of time so so i think if we do have data on reputation i think it's a better choice than just the focusing on, on, on one uh, single crisis and uh, i think that's a data set of for the rap risk uh, published uh, by some Swiss agency and it's available in WRDS and it's uh, really uh, give uh, each uh, company a reputation risk score. I think that's a very good one uh, at the, the corporate level. And I hope maybe one more uh, scholar could use it and uh, capture the reputation at the firm level. Yeah, I, I certainly think I think rep, rep risk is, is definitely an interesting data set for for understanding media coverage of firms and the sort of adversity that that, that firm behaviours or events are, are treated with. I wonder, um, kind of different tack on question, and, and again responding to some of the issues that that one or two uh, one or two colleagues are, are raising via the chat around sort of policy implications of all of this um you know so for, so for you bill for example you know if, if country uh, if country reputation matters for for outward fdi pairings you know what what are the policy implications for uh, the building of csr reputation and so on and so forth to to get the right kinds of outcomes uh, similarly for andrew and julia you know what 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 should one make as a policy maker of the differences in uh, speed of transition organizationally that you see in your analysis? And same really for you, Nan, you know, what's the, what are the regulatory and policy implications for home and host countries of the differences you see of, of the behavior of subsidiaries you're seeing in the Chinese context? So, so maybe Bill to you first. Yeah, so I think you know, this is you know, an excellent question again. I think, uh, you know, in our case, uh, the, the basically the study kind of, you know, kind of implies you know, that countries need to develop policies if they want to attract more investment you know, for a, a country with less CSR uh, reputation and less CSR activity. They want to attract investment from countries that have firms with greater CSR policies and need to put policies in place that encourage this investment, right? Uh, you know, for example, a, a great example that's commonly used is Colombia. You know, Colombia, when I grew up, was known as you know, the place for drug havens, and, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of you know, big war, you know, drug wars and things like that. And, you know, through a series of you know, very strong firm government initiatives, you know, it's changed that a lot. So the reputation's still there to somewhat, but, you know, now it's, you know, it's one of the countries with the greatest participation in the UN global contract. Compact. It's one of the countries that's really you know, built built up its you know status. So in Latin America, you know, is a, a country that's on the move. 
And part of this is because of government policy and the government initiative to really, you know, clean clean up their act and you know improve their CSR policies and, and attract firms that are going to do, you know, be, be better firms. Uh, and so I think you know that that's the main implication. Uh, I do want to maybe add too that you know, uh, building on Andrew's comment from the last question, you know, uh, reputation is the most reputation theory says reputation is defined by the expectations of the, the people doing the assessment. And so, you know, so, so how the people in the local environment perceive a, a factor is very important in how the, the reputation of firms or countries or industries. Uh, and so, so if, if firms in one country view an industry, view these factors as important in industry evaluation, they may have reputation, give reputation assessments very different than, uh, you know, assessors in another country or even, you know, different measures that involve on the public versus the financial evaluators versus, you know, whoever, the reputation could vary for the same firm uh, or the same industry just based on which party's doing the assessment. So this is very important when we design our, our, our theories and when we do our empirical studies to know who, whose reputation to whom are we really evaluating. Thank you. Oh boy, error. Uh, Andrew, Julia. So, so um, policy implications of, of differences in, in in rate of transition that you see in your work. I mean, we saw probably two of them. Um, one is so we had this uh, regulatory coercive pressure variable in there, and we could find a significant effect of this one. So that is a little bit encouraging, although the effect was not super strong. The good thing about that finding is probably um, so in general, there is this fear of the pollution heaven hypothesis so that uh, companies which face strong pressure in one country would go to another. That's not easily possible in oil and gas because in particular not for production companies because the assets are where they are and, and you just cannot go away from those ones so very easily. So um, you have to do something here. And at the same time, we see that uh, regulation happens everywhere, so the demand side will change, meaning that the customer side will actually change, and then it doesn't matter where you're actually located. Um, the other thing was we our measure for normative social pressure was one which looked into uh, the election of green parties in a country. So here we had this idea that um, a society which emphasizes environmental protection would be more inclined to um, elect a green party into, um, into governments. And that one was also uh, positive and significant quite substantially actually. So both of those are, are somewhat related to once these regulation, regulating forces are there, they drive um, a change in the behavior, which is I think encouraging because voluntary self-determination uh, is probably insufficient in the oil and gas sector. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Now, implications policy-wise that come from your work, really, for for you know how home and host countries might think about regulating or influencing the behaviour of subsidiaries overseas. So, in terms of the the host country government, I think they at least in in the China case, I think many multinationals they kind of have higher level of CSR practice. So. For the, for the Chinese government, I think they could really uh, try to uh, set some 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 regulation or some some ways to learn from the, the higher standard of CSR brought by the multinational, so that to improve the overall level of CSR in the, in the, in, the, in, the China, in in China. I think that's uh, that's one implication from my my work. Wonderful, thanks. I wonder. Um, I wonder. You know, we're, we're relatively getting on in our in our conversation now. I wonder if each each of the authors could share the the killer idea they think that their study provoked for them that researchers in the field really now need to think about and should consider for their next project. So to to you, Bill. This is a good question. I mean, I think I think I one thing. You know the. The killer idea. So, so, so I mean, the one, the one thing that was eye-opening for me was the diffuse reciprocity literature, which I was completely unaware of. And uh, you know, our, our co-author Elizabeth, she brought in from the uh, political science field. Uh, so, so I really think in one thing, our our study kind of uh, 
emotes is that you know the you know the need to look cross cross disciplinary, particularly in CSR type studies, uh, to bring in ideas because business business has one focus, uh, but other fields have lots of other focuses that are complementary. And particularly when you're looking at issues that are multi level, I mean we focused on the country level, but we realize you know this is a country with and then industry and then firm and a subsidiary multi-level issue, you really need to bring perspectives in from other fields to get a full understanding of what's going on. So I guess that's my big output. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I have to say, I, I really love the the infusion of political science uh, in, in your study. And I, I've done, done something similar recently in terms of an AMP we had out recently that imported societalization, which is really a kind of way of thinking about uh, rapid tipping points in in kind of normative social uh, views on, on issues, and I, I think there's there's a lot to learn. I think in in uh, uh, in international business research and more broadly for CSR research of of being able to integrate some of these um, really interesting theoretical perspectives from outside. So Andrew, um, your you know the great thing you learned, the killer idea that you would pass on to somebody who was who was uh, contemplating their own perhaps PhD research or study in this area now? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a strategy guy and my co-author Conan is a strategy guy and, and Julie is a, we're, we're trying to make her into a strategy person. And I, I think the thing that we've learned that is perhaps, it's not actually published in the Jibs paper, but I think that what we are learning is that we are becoming increasingly skeptical of the ability of oil and gas companies to transition away from oil and gas, to be honest. Um, we are, we are, they are making some tentative steps into renewable energy, but for a variety of reasons, we just don't think that they are going to become renewable energy companies uh, and maintain an oil and gas footprint at the same time. So you know, we're trying to flesh that out with some, uh, you know, I mentioned we've submitted a proposal. We're trying to flesh that out in some more detail. And we, we don't, you know, we're, we're, we're a little bit data light with that kind of perspective, but I think we're gonna be able to uh, push the ideas a little bit further. So I don't know that it's not necessarily a killer idea in the paper, but it's, it's sort of where we think we're, we're going with what we've learned so far about what's happening in, in, the, in the industry. Yeah, I think that's really thoughtful. I mean, it, it, it is surprising quite how slowly some of these things happen, isn't it? Um, Nan, uh, your, your great takeaway from your study around, around where productive future work might go. I think, the, the, as I said, the, the environment is becoming more hostile. So for multinationals, they are facing increasing a lot of foreigners. So I think the interesting question to ask is how firms manage to reduce the liability of foreigners from different stakeholders. So I think the, the, the not only consider the economic operations to adapt, but also social adaptation. And so but how do they really do that in a way that can convince local stakeholders that they are truly genuine about what they do, not just for some economic concerns. I think that's the challenge for, 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 for the managers of uh, multinationals. And I think that's an interesting uh, uh, academic question to ask as well. I think that's uh, something that's uh, uh, interesting to look at. Yeah, I, I think the intra-firm gradients in these things are, are really, really, really super interesting. They're just something that are very, very difficult to uh, to access empirically, which I think is 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 a super challenge. And, and one, your paper, I think, you know, what's so exceptional about it from my standpoint is um, uh, is simply that you're you're able to shine a light on something that nearly no other empirical inquiry really can. Um, you know, there's a, there's a very small number of um, you know, industry specific studies on things like electricity generation and so on that, that do that kind of thing. But but there really isn't very much out there that's, that's like that at all. Klaus, do you want to grab it back from me? Yes, it's it's been a fascinating discussion. It brings up a lot of issues. One issue that I've been thinking about right now is that the subtleties in which the expectations in different countries are actually locations. Uh, when Andrew mentioned Canada, I was thinking, uh, people in uh, Alberta have a different view of the oil and gas industry than in Br British Columbia. 
they almost go on trade war with each other over a pipeline right now or over the last couple of years already. So the expectation as to what is good practice on social environmental issues varies a lot about uh, between countries. And I think that is an insight sort of from the international business perspective to the business and society uh, scholarly community that, that Steve represents here, that I think we should uh, drive home because a lot of the public debates in many countries assume that, yeah, we sort of know what is good social or environmental practice, and we expect the others to have a similar understanding and the subtleties in which that varies across societies is I think not very well understood. And the research agenda that we've talked about here today brings that out very, very clearly. Uh, with that, let me thank all the contributors uh, today, especially the presenters, uh, but also everybody who asked questions uh, through the Q&A function. Thanks to Steve for uh, connecting with that business and society community and asking very good uh, questions that are really uh, bring out quite a few issues for future research. Let me close by saying, please, everybody, watch uh, your email intray or your Twitter feed uh, for announcements of uh, future webinars. Uh, we will, are uh, having a few ideas that we are currently working on, things like international finance and IP, international marketing. Uh, we will have something on the notion of cultural distance, which is a very central construct in, in the IP literature. And then I very much look forward to a webinar that I expect we will have around the uh, GIPS Decade Award paper um, and the commentaries that I've written around it that is on the topic of cross-cultural teams, uh, a topic that I think is very exciting, especially now that we are moving toward working in global virtual teams and look at our team members on a Zoom screen, just like we're doing right now here. With then again, thank you everybody for participating. And I hope I will see you again uh, very soon at another webinar. Bye-bye.